In this second video on Debye Huckel theory, I want to continue pushing the theory to make a contact with thermodynamics and thermodynamic quantities. So, in order to do that, let's start with computing and understanding the total electrostatic energy. And so, as I say here, our ultimate goal with Debye Huckel theory is to understand how the chemical potential, which is a free energy, changes with concentration of the electrolytes. And so, as a first step, we can look at the total electrostatic energy, and let's just think about one ion for a moment. So this is a potential energy. The potential energy of that ion interacting with all the surrounding medium, what will that be? Well, it's going to be the charge on the ion itself, so let's call the ion I. So this is subscripted with I, this is the charge of ion I. Because we're working with electrostatics, in the denominator there's going to be a 4 pi epsilon 0 epsilon, where epsilon is the dielectric constant of the medium. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate, I'm going to go outward from that ion through the medium, and I'm just going to ask, what is the charge density that is in the medium around ion R? Remember, that was something that we derived effectively. And then 4 pi R squared dr, so that's part of doing a, a radial integral. And if you look back at the last video, and you were to plug in the expression for rho sub i that's necessary, you get a relatively simple result, and again, I'm not going to push through a lot of detailed calculus. I, I want to focus on the qualitative, and to some extent quantitative, aspects of the theory. You end up with a relatively simple expression that the energy of the ion is minus qi squared, so square of the charge on the ion itself, kappa appears in there, 4 pi epsilon 0 epsilon. And if I now ask about all the ions in a given volume, V. So remember that hidden in this kappa is the bulk number density. So there's already kind of a number per volume. So if I want to get all the ions, I gotta multiply times the volume. Then I'll get the total number. And when I do that, I end up with the electrostatic energy for all the ions minus, here's that volume that I needed to multiply by, kT over 8 pi, and now kappa appears to the cubed to the third power, kappa cubed. Remember that kappa itself, I haven't got it on this slide just because it's hard to fit everything on one slide. If you recall, kappa has embedded in it already some 4 pi, an epsilon 0, an epsilon. So we've just kind of simplified notation by absorbing certain quantities into kappa and bringing other quantities out. So you might wonder, where did that kT come from? Well, remember that kappa has a kT in it as well. So when we went from kappa to the first power to kappa to the third power, the kTs that came in there have to be removed by putting them in the numerator, for instance. So I'll let you look back, if you'd like, at an old slide that has kappa on it, and you can, you can sort of see the relationship there. More interestingly, though, now I want to make the connection from the internal energy, U, to the free energy. And in this case, I'll, I'll use Helmholtz free energy. So there's a Gibbs-Helmholtz equation in Helmholtz free energy, and we've occasionally used the one in Gibbs free energy. I'll just remind you that it says that the partial derivative of the free energy divided by temperature with respect to temperature is minus, in this case, U for the Helmholtz free energy over T squared. When this is a Gibbs free energy, you'll remember that this is an enthalpy. But this is a Helmholtz, so that's internal, and that's why we're using Helmholtz here. But remember, the chemical potential in the Helmholtz scheme is equal to the chemical potential in the Gibbs scheme as long as you're holding their respective state variables constant. We learned that when we first worked with chemical potentials. And so given, this is just from the last slide, what the total electrostatic energy is, I can now express this as d of A over t, so I'll move this dt over to the other side, is equal to, so here's u, and my negative sign is canceled, this negative sign, dt. Now I integrate both sides. So I'm going to integrate from no free energy, so a way to think about that would be as if the temperature were infinite, for example, to some actual free energy, A over t, and that will have a corresponding change in temperature then of from infinite temperature to a given temperature. Now, I, I can't just... Uh, 
hide all my uh, different constants in kappa. I really need to expand kappa because kappa's got some t's in it. So again, if you have an old slide, you can look at kappa, but trust me, I've expanded it for you appropriately here. So this integral is easy to do. It's, you get a over t uh, evaluated at some position, minus zero. So this is a over t minus, so here's the integral. Integral from infinity to t prime equals t. Here are all the variables we need. Here's the dependence on t. And it's in, it, fundamentally, it's a whole lot of constants and an integral of one over t to the five halves dt. So I'll end up with needing to evaluate one over t to the three halves. At some point I plug in an infinity as one limit, that'll go away. So I just end up with the temperature I'm interested in. And fundamentally, uh, when you work it all out, you'll see that what's happened here is you get a two thirds times one over eight, you get a two over 24, you get a one twelfth, and otherwise it looks pretty much like uh, the total electrostatic energy here. So actually I'll, I'll rearrange it to make it a little bit prettier. And the electrostatic free energy is equal to minus VKB T kappa cubed over 12 pi. And as I stare at this, it does uh, look to me as though there, there's supposed to be a minus sign here. Okay, all I did was multiply times temperature, so that, that's not what introduced that. So that's a typo on the slide, minus side here. Uh, what I want to call to your attention is, look at the relationship between these two. All the constants are the same, right? The only difference is the internal energy has a one over eight factor. The free energy has a one over 12 factor. And so why would the free energy be less negative than the internal energy? And what's the relationship between Helmholtz free energy and internal energy? They're related by an entropy term, so a minus TS. And so the issue is that in order to achieve that favorable electrostatic energy here in U, I had to organize my ions in a certain way, right? They are not perfectly randomly distributed, which would be maximum entropy. And so there is a free energy cost associated with that organization, and that's why the free energy is a little bit different. But, but it's very convenient to work with the free energy because if those electrostatic interactions are the only reason for non-ideality in a solution, so I'll assume that's the case, I'm gonna work at so low a concentration of electrolyte solute that really the only thing happening there is electrostatics. Then it'll be the case that the chemical potential, which is the partial derivative of this expression, A electrostatic, with respect to the number of my ion, whether it be I or J, there will be two ions, is equal to KT log the activity coefficient because this is where all the non-ideality is, right? If it were ideal, gamma would be one. So if it's non-ideal, gamma won't be. So now once more, in order to evaluate that, uh, I'm gonna move my log gamma over here and then I'm actually going to carry out the partial differentiation on this Again, expanding kappa because I need to find the, the numbers. Where are the numbers? The numbers were in those number densities, C. So here's number of ions divided by volume. That's what a number density is. So that's not too hard a derivative to take. You see I have a three halves power, I'll bring it down. Um, I'll end up with a number density to the one half and then I'll re-express it as, as what it is, a concentration. So here's the differentiation. I push that all the way through and I come up with this final expression where I've simplified it again by putting kappa back in. And the last thing I need to do is I need to get to that thing that I can measure, which was the mean ionic activity coefficient. So this is the hypothetical, this, this activity coefficient is the hypothetical activity coefficient associated with only one ion. I, I can't make a solution like that, I can only talk about it. But remember how this measurable quantity is related to these hypothetical quantities. And so that implies that log of this thing, I'll, when I take a log, I'll take this exponent and I'll multiply the log and then I'll move it over here so it's a denominator. 
And when I take a log of this thing, I get some exponents that come down and it's a log of a product, so I get a sum. So I hope you see how log of mean ionic activity coefficient is related in this way. And now I plug in my value for the individual ionic activity coefficients. That comes out front here. So all the little constants do, kappa, eight pi, epsilon zero, Boltzmann's constant times temperature. Left inside here are the charges on the individual ions and the stoichiometry of the salt itself. And in fact, this expression simplifies to give you minus, so charge actually has sign associated with it. I, I don't want to worry about that sign, or, or rather, when one does it properly, one discovers that you get the absolute value of the charge of the cation times the charge of the anion times all these constants. And if that simplification from here to here looks kind of magical, here's your chance to experience the magic. So uh, the self-assessment is to prove that. Prove that this is equal to this. And I will give you a hint as you set about that proof. Namely, you're going to need to use electroneutrality. So here's the proof in uh, looks like three lines, and you'll see electroneutrality used, and I'll let you take a moment to study that. <coughs> so where are we going? Why is this all important? Um, here is the interesting and important feature of the theory. We have here that the log of the mean ionic activity coefficient is given by this expression, where kappa, remember, is defined this way. Kappa squared, to avoid having to write to the one-half power over this whole thing. Uh, and what I've done, I've, I've written kappa several times in prior slides. I've written it slightly differently here. Instead of writing the charge inside the summation here, I've pulled the units of charge out I've made it Avogadro's number times the charge on an electron. So this E sub minus, that's not E the base of the natural logarithm system. That's the charge on an electron. So that's where the charge units have gone. And so this becomes a concentration as opposed to a, uh, a, as opposed to a charge. Um, and Z is just the number of the, yeah, I think I, blah. <laughs> Let's do that again. Good news is I paused after the self-assessment, so I'll just dive right back in. Let me be sure that I do it right. Um, yeah, got it. Okay. All right, so where are we and where are we going? Why is, why is this all important? So. Through debye huckel theory, we have derived this important expression that the log of the mean ionic activity coefficient can be determined from knowledge of the charges of the individual components of the salt, kappa, and kappa, remember, is defined as over here. I've written it a little differently than I have on prior slides. So on prior slides, what was inside the, uh, the summation was charge times number density. And so what I've done here is I've separated charge into, instead of electrostatic units, which would be like a number times the charge on the electron, I've actually pulled the charge on the electron out. So it's here. This E sub minus is not the base of the natural logarithm system. It's the charge on an electron. And I've left behind just the number. So it's kind of like when we say, what's the charge on chloride? It's one. We don't say it's, you know, whatever the charge is in electrostatic units, we just say it's one, minus one. Um, so that's what the Z is that's left behind here. And I've also replaced number density with concentration in terms of molarity. And so in order to do that, I need to take an Avogadro's number out. So I'm not numbers anymore, I'm moles. So I've done that, and that appears here as well. And the reason I've done that is that this is the ionic strength that I, I promised a little while ago to define better. So the ionic strength is defined as one half sum over all the constituent ions. There could be more than just two. To date, we've really only worked with two just to make life a little easier, and that's reflected over here. 
but a generic expression for the ionic strength would include all the ions in the system. The concentration of the ion times the square of the charge on the ion. And so the sign doesn't matter in that case. And the charge is an integer, one, two, three, four, what have you. So for the specific case of an aqueous solution at a temperature of 298 Kelvin, we know all these quantities. We just set 298, we know Boltzmann's constant, 78.3, you can look up the permittivity of free space, the charge on an electron, Avogadro's number, and so on. Those would all become minus 0.509 times x times y, that's again these integer number charges on the ions, times the ionic strength. And so what that says, why is that important? It says that at low enough concentrations, because that's where Debye-Huckel theory works, the log of the mean ionic activity coefficient should decrease linearly as the square root of the ionic strength, right? Because it goes as kappa, and kappa squared goes as the ionic strength, so it goes as the square root of the ionic strength with a slope of minus something x times y. And if one actually looks at this and carries out those vapor pressure measurements and plots the activity, the log of the mean ionic activity coefficient as a function of ionic strength, and so that's what's done here, for two different salts, hydrogen chloride, which does separate in water into protons and chloride ions, or calcium chloride. Those are different ionic strengths because they're different species, but we can still do the plot against ionic strength. What one finds is, sure enough, these little dotted lines, those are, it's plotted against uh, the square root of the ionic strength. And so we've said that you ought to be linear. Here's the line that is linear in the square root of the ionic strength that Debye-Huckel theory predicts from knowledge of you know, one to two, one to one. And sure enough, as we get closer and closer to infinite dilution, they follow those lines perfectly. All right, so Debye-Huckel is an accurate representation at very, very dilute solutions. And notice that that's, that would be independent of the nature of any one-to-one -one electrolyte. Could be HCl, could be sodium chloride, could be potassium chloride, cesium chloride, cesium fluoride. Actually, cesium fluoride is not a strong electrolyte. It doesn't separate enough. But anyway, anything that separates. So that's the power of Debye-Huckel theory. It tells us what any salt that is one-to-one, -one, or in this case, one-to-two, how it will behave. Now, this plot actually is taken from a source that also plots a somewhat more sophisticated approximation. It's uh, you know, derived making other assumptions, and you see that, that that formula is still more accurate out to higher ionic strengths, but that's not terribly important for us. You can uh, develop fitting parameters. What's really important is that we can use this Debye-Huckel theory to understand limiting behavior. And while that may not seem like a huge uh, jump yet, we are going to find it very useful when we get to module 13 and we take a look at electrochemistry, which is certainly important from the standpoint of energy and batteries and so forth. All right, that is the end of Debye-Huckel theory. Let's go on to review this module.